Al Jazeera Podcasts. Today, the archives of a revolution. There was a new political horizon opening up. The geopolitical map of the world was changing. How a Yugoslavian filmmaker's footage, unseen for decades, helped Algerians win their independence. The story of the online movement simply got written out of history. I'm Kevin Hurton, and this is The Take. The Algerian War had its final convulsion. The granting of independence was followed by OAS murders that sent Muslims raging through the streets. This is how American news agency, the Associated Press, covered Algeria's victory in its war for independence from France in 1962. Algeria was then a mirror for many nations, and Algerians' quest to break free from French colonial rule electrified dozens of newly independent countries across the global south. So much so that the United Nations adopted the 1960 Declaration on the Granting of Independence to Colonial Countries and Peoples. It was a watershed moment for a world dominated by the Cold War geopolitical chess game, and Algerians were at the crux of it. Once peace was restored, the Algerians went to the polls. They confirmed the wisdom of de Gaulle's policies, as did a plebiscite in France. And a new nation joined the world community. It had taken eight years of bloody war, but it wasn't only weapons that yielded victory to the Algerians. The media was as important a battlefield in this anti-colonial struggle against France. It was incredibly important for me to gather the stories and the oral histories of the people who had been involved in this kind of media campaign and diplomatic revolution. My name is uh, Mila Turajlic, and I'm a documentary filmmaker, um, an artist from Belgrade, born in Yugoslavia, and I kind of split my time now between Belgrade and Paris. So Mila, the name of your film is, well, you've done many films, but the film we're talking about is called Cine Gorillas. The film starts in Belgrade, the city that used to be the capital of former Yugoslavia. We see footage of the late cameraman Stefan Labudovic going through hours of footage that he shot as a young man. Historia. Historia. Now, this man is not well known in the West, but is a revered figure in some parts of the world, especially in the global south. So can you tell me the story of how you met him and found out about this vast archive of his past work? It was kind of an incredible detective story that's gone on for about 10 years for me now. I met Stefan Lobudovic in 2014. And bizarrely enough, even though, you know, I live in Belgrade and he lived in Belgrade, we actually met in Algiers. <laughs> and the reason we met in Algiers is that Cinema Comunista, this, the, the first film that I'd made, had won an award at a film festival in Algiers, and I'd been invited back the same year that Stefan Labudovic had been the guest of honor of the festival. He was the guest of honor of the festival because the Algerians considered him the cinematic eye of the Algerian Liberation War, whereas in Belgrade, very, very few people had ever heard of him. I ignored, really, his existence until the Algerians made me aware of it. Labudovic had been the personal cameraman of Marshal Josip Bruz, better known as Tito, the longtime president of the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. As a cameraman, Labudovic worked his entire career for the Yugoslav Newsreels, which was then the only film studio run by the government. He was born in 1928, and after the war, he became a cameraman for the Newsreels, and he spent his entire career working for the Newsreels, but in a very specific role, which is that he had been assigned to travel and follow President Tito. In 1954, Tito had started traveling for the first time outside of Europe. It's very much a result of the fact that Yugoslavia had been thrown out of the Soviet bloc and was kind of adrift diplomatically and was looking to build new alliances, mm. and this coincides with the moment in which there's a kind of birth of a third world. You know, there's a many countries emerging from colonialism. And so Labudovic was the person who was filming all of this. These first encounters between really legendary political leaders, father figures for their nations. And so as Tito traveled, Labudovic filmed. Yeah. 
And, you know, these kind of first insights that Yugoslavs had into this kind of emerging uh, world um, became the kind of prequel to what would be the most important moment of Laburovic's career, the Algerian Liberation War. Yugoslavia was sending arms, they were sending uniforms, they were, they were supporting the Algerian Liberation Movement. But it was a decisive thing for the Algerians to try also to lead a diplomatic war against France and to try and bring that diplomacy into the UN. And for that, they decided they needed a film. Maya Plavšić, who was the international liaison of the Yugoslav Red Cross, puts it like this. Our newsreels reported because the Algerians didn't have a film production or filmmakers or newsreels. Nothing. It was all French. So the Algerians asked Tito to send them someone who could film, who could document their movement. So Tito sent Labudovic, his best cameraman. Labudovic was sent by Tito himself to assist the Algerian liberation movement by making a documentary film about their activities and about them that was going to be screened at the UN. And from this initial uh, mission, you know, which was a clandestine entering into Algeria via Tunisia and uh, filming within the ranks of the Algerian Liberation Army, he ended up actually spending three years filming the Algerian Liberation War, and he ultimately filmed something like 83 kilometers of footage. Entrance in Tunisia. Tunisia means Algeria. This is Tunisia, and this is Algeria. We entered here, Sukaras. But you can't approach five kilometers near the border toward Algeria. What's really spectacular about his footage is that he actually brought a 35 millimeter camera with him. And so that's <laughs> yes. very, very rare. And so this is, this is the kind of extraordinary quality of this material. And so when I met Lapurovic in Algiers, he was 87 years old. He was the last living cameraman of the newsreels. He was really given a hero's welcome in Algeria. And I was lucky to be able to film that because it ended up being his last visit to Algiers. We returned to Belgrade and I began making a documentary film about him. I filmed that. Here's Algeria. It's still here. Here's Algeria. Here's Algeria. It's all here. When it comes to Algeria, it's all here. All of the rushes that he had filmed for the Algerians were still kept in Belgrade. We started digitizing those, started looking through that material. He started kind of deciphering it for me, um, narrating it for me. And it became a really extraordinary project of just trying to kind of understand, but then also reactivate this footage that's laid dormant for, you know, for more than 60 years at this point. You know, the 35 millimeter thing is not something we should take lightly. There is just no equivalent of this. All of this footage from the era is all shot on 16 or even 8 millimeter. These are like film quality. You could show it in a theater. It looks incredible. And there's just so much of this. How much of the archive have you actually been able to catalog and archive so far? Uh, frustratingly little. All of this was completely unknown to me. And not only was it unknown to me, I never found a single article or book about Yugoslavia's cinematic collaborations with the non-online world, which is why I, the project became much more than making a documentary film about him. Established in 1961, the non-aligned movement was a group of states that chose not to take sides during the Cold War. Key members included India, Egypt, Indonesia, and of course, Yugoslavia. At its peak, it represented about one-third of the world's population. I began to access state archives like documents and papers to try and understand the kind of political context of all of this. So uh, my point is that the research enlarged itself instead of reducing itself. And so I would say that at this point, the project has been in existence for about 10 years. Uh, we've called it the non-aligned newsreels because it goes beyond the Algerian war. And I would say that after all this time, we've probably managed to index and scan not even 20, 30 percent of that particular collection in the newsreels, which is these non-aligned collaborations. So it's deeply frustrating. My guide through the footage, once Seven passed away and was no longer there to help me decipher it, was an extraordinary man 
who still alive, who lives in Algiers, who was in charge of creating the cinema unit for the political commissariat of the Algerian Liberation Army, and he's in the film. So Stevan kind of opened the door to my meeting Ferhat Berahal, and then Ferhat became the person who helped me understand a lot of what is in the footage. I joined the Algerian resistance at the age of 19. At 20, I already had men under my command. Each week a unit would see a film, mostly war films or westerns, always with some action, from time to time, to raise the morale of the troops, help them forget their troubles, the hardships. That's it. And then one other element that really helped me because we're talking about rushes, we're talking about unedited footage uh, that's stored in Belgrade, was Stevens' diaries. And it's fascinating to be able to match his diaries with the footage. Because he didn't have digital, he was keeping a mental running list of everything he shot. Absolutely. <laughs> Amazing, right? Just as a documentarian yourself, you just, you probably, I know you've said this in the past, that you just marveled at, at the, the skill and just the technical expertise required to do what he did. But also, you know, he was chosen to be President Tito's cameraman for a reason. Mm. He was one of the most talented cameramen in the former Yugoslavia. What were the things that he was trying to show about the Algerian Liberation Army? First of all, that it's an army. Because what they were working for was counter-propaganda to French propaganda. This territory, which is four times the size of France, was at the beginning of the last century a country without future. The intervention of the French has given it a future. Here, there is no racial segregation or discrimination. Europeans and Muslims live on an equal footing. This community needs to be healed to create a new French Algeria that is more vibrant and stronger, which will be the work of these 400,000 young soldiers who came from the other side of the Mediterranean. French propaganda at the time was that this was a terrorist, you know, bound of outlaws, rebels, violent. And so the mission here was to tell a counter story, which is to show that it's a uniformed army, that it's a disciplined army, that there is a hierarchy of command. Then another thing that you really see in the kind of visual grammar of the material is that they're showing that it's legitimate in the sense that it is supported by the people mm -hmm. and it is composed of the people. So, you know, there is these, this imagery of them being also a progressive uh, movement that is, you know, educating the population that is going to try and, you know, kind of build, uh, prepare Algeria for the moment of its independence. It's absolutely fascinating to have, you know, collaborators who are still alive, who part of the creation of these images, to help me understand what we're looking at. How Lubudovic's reels helped the Algerians win the war and why they're so relevant still today. That's after the break. So Mila, let's go back to the 1950s, just for people who don't know the history. I mean, this was a time of mass decolonization. Uh, I think in 1960, 17 new countries entered the UN and most were French colonies. But Algeria was different. This was a struggle where France really believed that Algeria was part of France. It wasn't just a colony that could be discarded. So this was a very brutal war. It's worth going back to the Second World War. It's worth going back to mentioning the fact that there were many colonies participating in the Second World War on the side of the Allied forces. And I think the story of decolonization in some ways really begins there because, you know, once fascism had been defeated, um, the kind of underlying moral claims for holding onto the colonies, you know, were really brought into question. Many tried to negotiate some kind of continued presence in their colonies. And this is, again, the case of France, which, as you rightly mentioned, let go of many of its African colonies in order to hold on to Algeria. And indeed, Algeria was not considered by the French as a colony. Mm. And Algiers, I think, at the time was considered simply as the third or fourth largest city in France. And so I think for the French, for a very long time, it was absolutely unimaginable that they would let go of Algeria. And so, as you said, it was an incredibly bloody war. And the Algerians were overpowered by, you know, a military force that at the time was the fourth military force in the world. So very quickly, already in the first two years after the uprising began, it began in November, 1st of November, 1954, they adopted another front in their struggle, which was going to be a diplomatic front. 
I think there was an awareness that it was going to be very difficult to win independence militarily, even though they were going to continue a military struggle, and that victory would ultimately in some ways be a diplomatic victory. So the whole idea was to try and internationalize the Algerian question, to kind of get the world involved, world public opinion involved. And at the time, the United Nations was an incredibly important political forum. It was seen as, it's hard for us, actually, it's hard for us to imagine that. Because it's, yeah, it just seems so irrelevant now, but at the time, it, it really mattered. One thing I found extraordinary is that there was a decree in the French colonies back then that actually forbade the local populations from filming themselves. So in the midst of this liberation struggle, the French are pumping out all these newsreels. And again, newsreels were the currency of the day. There was This is pre-TV for the most of the world. And no one is seeing the other side. They're seeing these French-made newsreel saying things like, in your film, you show some of these, French intervention has given Algeria a future, showing these pictures of smiling Algerians enjoying their life under colonial rule. And the guys in the ALN, in the uh, the Liberation Army, are aware that information and image are playing a huge role in movements like theirs. Another person in the film states, the shots from our guns can't be heard all the way to the United Nations. So how did the media that Labudovich was producing help win the war ultimately. So the idea was that if you could show the world what was going on, and particularly if you could show the horror of what was going on, and also the kind of unitedness and political legitimacy of you know the liberation movement, that you would turn world international world opinion to your side, and that that would make it morally untenable for France to remain in Algeria, and that is what they did. So they waged a campaign that was aimed at. You know, they had an information bulletin, they had um, radio broadcasts that were centered in Cairo, for example. But cinema was incredibly important because it fulfilled several roles. One is, as I said, they could organize screenings at the United Nations, they could organize screenings at universities and film clubs, but they could also use the films as a recruitment tool. Because the population was illiterate, to show them films of the struggle was a way to communicate what were the aims of the Algerian army and trying to win the local population also to their side. There was another great revolutionary leader, a man called Amilcar Cabral um, from Guinea-Bissau, who wrote that, you know, what they were facing is a wall of silence. And that wall of silence is essentially their inability to counter the West's narrative of what was going on. And cinema was really there to try and break that wall of silence. And as you say, one of the most um, extraordinary things for me to read and learn about was this decree called the Laval Decree, which had been introduced by a French minister by the name of Laval, which had simply forbade indigenous populations from filming themselves. So there were no skill sets, there was no technology, there was no equipment, there was nothing with which they could tell their own story, which is why these gestures of kind of solidarity, of international solidarity, of cameramen coming from the outside to film them were so meaningful. Lubudovich didn't consider himself a documentarian. He said he was a propagandist, a soldier in a propaganda war. And I know that that has a lot of different connotations now than it did then. So that's why I want to ask you, does, is he implying that he was distorting the truth with his work or does it mean something different to him? No, I don't think truth really factors into this. I, I you know, as, as someone who's a documentary filmmaker myself, I would never say that I, my image show the truth, you know, the factual truth. Going back to the birth of documentary cinema, it was always a misnomer, and it very rarely is. You know, in already in the sense that we as people who are making the images are choosing our frame, are choosing what's in the frame and what's outside the frame. It's very, very difficult for me when documentary footage is taken as, uh, as indexical proof of anything. So uh, in that sense, I felt that working, for me, working with Abudovich was simplified by the fact that he was incredibly straightforward in how he saw his role. You know, so we didn't have to have like long uh, convoluted discussions about is this material propaganda or not propaganda. For him, it's incredibly simple. You know, he was working for a film studio whose job was to furnish the, the images for the political narrative of a country that was being created, which is, you know, a federal Yugoslavia. Mm -hmm. And so for me, from that point on, the status of these images is incredibly easy to, to situate. As you mentioned, propaganda wars, narratives and counter narratives, the kind of grammar of cinema that emerges around political projects. I've never tried to historicize the images. I've never been that interested in, oh, is this historical proof of this battle or that battle or, you know, this unit or that unit. It never really interested me because I always saw them as a result of a political project. 
there was for me an underlying project in making Sinegarelas, which is which speaks to media literacy, which is really to make people think and and really read images from a different perspective, from the perspective of who is making this footage. What purpose is it supposed to serve? You know, how am I supposed to be reading it? Because I think for me in today's media, kind of heavily mediatized um, um, sphere, we are so desperately lacking in media literacy in a kind of ability to read the images before us. Mm. Is there any lessons from the success of his project that you think apply now to so many people who are interested in decolonization? Solidarity. It's that simple. It's a word that doesn't get used enough, I think, you know, but it is absolutely a gesture of solidarity to say there is something that I can, there's a skill I have, you know, that I can bring to another people's struggle for liberation. They had an incredibly clear foresight that, you know, there was a new political horizon opening up. The geopolitical map of the world was changing. As you say, late 1950s, early 1960s is a kind of period of mass decolonization. And they arrive at the UN, which provides them with a forum, a kind of global table to which, you know, which they can now sit as independent countries. And they're incredibly savvy in their understanding of one fact, which is that they have the power of numbers. Mm -hmm. In terms of how many countries are arriving at that table as the global south, that they can vote as a bloc and that if they can figure out how to vote together as a bloc in the General Assembly of the UN, they can actually be a third power in this kind of two-sided Cold War. And that is a, an incredible amount of political foresight and vision, I would say, which in some way leads to the birth of an online movement, this idea that they are going to discuss their issues, they're going to come up with a common policy platform, they're going to do this before the UN General Assembly and they're going to appear at the UN General Assembly as a, you know, as a, as a kind of as one speaking in one voice. And it was an incredibly ambitious political dream. We live in a world that's very interesting. I don't know how how prevalent this is in your world, but in the documentary filmmaking world, the last ten years have really been about communities telling their own stories. You know, you mm. don't walk into another community and tell their story. It's really been about this idea of kind of grassroots storytelling and the right of each community to have its own voice and find its own voice. And it's an incredibly important and valuable way for turn in documentary filmmaking. But as a result, it sidelined a little bit the importance and impact of a gesture of solidarity, that you can be an outsider and bring something very, very valuable to the story of a struggle of a community. And so for me, that's been an incredible lesson as a filmmaker. Wow. Mila, thank you so much for coming on The Take. What a pleasure. <laughs> thank you. And that's The Take. This episode was produced by Marcos Bartolome and Veronique Ashaya with Duha Mossad, Manahil Navid, Noor Wazwaz, and me, Kevin Hurton, in for Malika Bilal. It was edited by Alexander Locke. Our sound designer is Alex Roldan. Alexander Locke is The Take's executive producer, and Ney Alvarez is Al Jazeera's head of audio. We'll be back tomorrow.